Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm honored to be part of the first Outlier Conference. Today, I'm going to walk you to different kind of data visualization libraries on the web. To tell you a little bit about myself, um, I spent several years at the University of Maryland doing PhD research on data visualization and try to visualize and make sense of really big data at Twitter, both for building internal tools and public facing visualizations. Now managing the data experience team at Airbnb, as well as contributing to open source projects. Throughout this experience, I wrote a decent amount of JavaScript or more recently TypeScript to build data visualization on the web. Every once in a while, somebody will ask me, which visualization library should I use? It is a simple yet difficult question. Um, almost everyone has heard of D3, of course, right? But what about the others? There are so many options offering different things. So a lot of time, the answer was, it depends, because typically making this decision is not about whether or not one library is better than another, but whether that library is more suitable for the person and task. However, um, I want a better way to compare these libraries and give a better answer than it depends. The plan was to understand the design space of libraries, which can be created by organizing existing libraries. This should give us a framework for comparing and reasoning. I propose this design space with two dimensions. One is the API design, which means how the library's authors decided the code should be written. Another one, which is more important, is the level of abstraction. Now let's go over the API design. A large number of libraries offer plain JavaScript API, for example, D3. Um, they do not depend on specific framework, such as React, Vue, Angular, and many others. So they can be used anywhere. Uh, the code, however, tends to be more imperative or closer to machine instructions than decorative or closer to the output that humans want to see. Some libraries, such as Vega, declare their entire API in a single JSON configuration, which is also framework agnostic. Um, JSON doesn't accept any function or custom object and enforce them on the declarative API. Um, the configuration can also be easily serialized and stored as text files or used with command line tools, which is an nice bonus. Um, in return, it is more difficult to integrate with other libraries. Some libraries, such as eSharts, offer the hybrid JSON with callbacks approach. Instead of plain JSON, um, a single configuration JavaScript object is used. It can accept Lambda functions, such as the format function you're seeing here on the screen, and sometimes non-primitive values. This leads to more flexibility and possible integration with other libraries through these functions traded with the serializable text output and strict enforcement of a fully decorative API. Um, when the extra features are not used, they look just like JSON. Other libraries fully embrace syntax of specific frameworks and provide better integration. For example, using a React-based library in a React web application, like the example here, provides better overall code consistency and optimization opportunities compared to adding an alien block of D3 code into an existing React app. The drawback is that um, you're going to need to know React, right? Uh, they require previous knowledge about the framework and are only appropriate choices when the framework is also used in the project. So now we have these four bands. Um, some libraries also offer multiple forms of APIs. For instance, DeckGL has multiple modules that offer different API design. Now let's dive into the level of abstraction. These levels map roughly and expressivity or how much we can actually customize. In other words, the higher level libraries usually require fewer lines of code, but then there are fewer things you can customize. On the other hand, you can customize more and more the lower level issues, but have to do more work. The first level is graphic libraries. This group of libraries lets a developer draw visual elements directly or perform traditional computer graphics operation. They have the highest level of expressivity and in return require the most effort to produce the same visualization. It usually doesn't have the concept of data, so it 
it's kind of your job to figure out what needs to be drawn and utilize the library to draw it. If you are trying to produce a quick bar chart immediately out of the box, this is probably not for you. However, these libraries let you tune for the performance optimization or produce five graphics that the higher level libraries may not offer. In this example, after figuring out that a 100 pixel square to represent your data, you can use P5 to draw the square. Um, here's another example that is framework specific uh, with React Graph. You can draw a sketchy graphic with it. And let's go to level two. The low level building blocks are quite independent and flexible. Each component or utility in this library serve a particular purpose and can be used in combination with components from the same libraries or other libraries. How they should be combined is roughly defined and leaves a lot up to the discretion of the developers. The most notable of this is D3. Um, it introduces a suite of low-level components and utilities such as selection, scales, etc., while leveraging the common standards such as DOM and SVG instead of defining our construct by itself. In this example, scales and selections building blocks offered by D3 are used in combination to create a simple bar chart. Um, the code starts from defining scale for X and Y at the top, create an SVG, uh, and then add the bars uh, or the rectangles that map to the data using the scales to encode the width and height. Authority 3 is the most well-known um, being the earlier libraries and covering the essentials. There are so many standalone libraries offering very specific functionalities that complement it. Some use the D3 prefix name, such as D3 annotation, that helps you annotate your visualization. Flubber helps you transition shapes smoothly. You have to combine it with other libraries to produce a complete visualization. Many graph layout algorithm libraries also fall into this category. Uh, you can use the algorithm libraries to figure out where to place the nodes and edges for the diagrams, then use the other libraries to handle the rendering. That's the beauty of the low-level building blocks. They are so independent from each other, and you can mix and match them together in so many ways. But D3 itself can work with React. Um, getting both of them to coexist nicely can be quite a challenge over time. Wistack is a great option if you want the building blocks similar to D3, but in React. Now, level three, um, the grammars. The visualization grammar contains libraries that are heavily inspired by the book, The Grammar of Graphics, which was introduced in the late 1990s and offer a new perspective on designing statistical graphics. Instead of referring to charts by traditional types, bar, pi, um, line, and whatever you can name it. The book calls out their shared structures and uses common structures to describe any chart. Similar to how the grammar of a language, such as English, defines part of speech and gives you a structure for combining these parts into a meaningful sentence. The grammar of graphics defines its own parts and provides a structure for combining them to describe an output graphics. The six parts are what Wilkinson defined in his grammar, data, transformation of data, scale, coordinate system, elements, and the aesthetics and guides. For example, the five lines on the top is a way to describe the chart below. It has two data sets. Using log scale, transpose the value onto x axis, then define the point element, um, encode the point position by city and year, and color them by year. Similarly, a grammar library defines a set of chart parts and specific way to compose them. This rigid structure is what differentiates them from the low level building blocks. And they are li less likely to work with other libraries because being a closed system like that. However, because they do not depend on chart types, um, kind of self-sufficient uh, ecosystems, the grammars can express a broad range of visualization on its own. Developers can quickly switch between different types of visualizations without changing or adding libraries, making it suitable for rapid data exploration, whether it is to find new insights 
or experimenting with different ritual representations of the same data. The code block here is a specification of a bar chart in Figalite. The data set is described on the top and then uh, in here the mark and encoding uh, define uh, equivalent to the element part of the grammar of graphic and its aesthetic. In contrast to the APIs of Vigalai, which is JSON, G2 provide visualization grammars with plain JS API, um, the shard component is declared, and then uh, set the data, set the coordinate, uh, set the scale, position, and the output can be seen on the right. Next, the high-level building blocks. Um, similar to the visualization grammars, each of these libraries also comes with its own set of components and a predetermined way to assemble them. However, their components are often larger pieces in comparison. A pattern of a uh, container component, which can include multiple series or layers, is quite common. Each of the series may be referenced by shard type, which is another distinction from the grammars. The overall framework may capture a smaller set of visualization compared to the grammar, but it can be more convenient. For example, a candlestick chart, which is a quite common chart in stock trading. You can use a candlestick series directly in each chart. Just specify the type being candlestick um, and give it the data uh, in the right format, and you get the candlestick chart. In Victory, you uh, there's a chart uh, at two axes, and then add the candlestick series with some settings and data. With only these few lines, you get the candlestick chart. Let's compare it with Vega Light Grammar, which doesn't know about the candlestick type. You have to define two layers of primitive shapes, one for line and another one for bar here, and then write how the color should be encoded um, and because they are layered, uh, they will be only on top of each other and produce the final output that looks like the candlestick chart. So same result, but a lot more effort. Last level, the chart templates. A library of this type can range from containing a single component to hundreds of components. Each component is referred to via its chart type. The best thing about the chart templates is that they are often ready to use straight out of the box and require the least effort to produce a usable output. Just use a chart type from its catalog, prepare data in a documented format, then plug the data and component together. Instead of trying to describe a pie chart with a grammar or learn how to implement it in D3, just check if there's any library provide a pie chart component. If there's such component, then just use it. If the library that you choose doesn't have it, then find another one. Also, novel visualization types, such as a new techniques that just came out of research, are often offered as a single component library if like this. Here's how to create a radar chart with chart JS. Just create a chart component, say the type is radar, give it the data, and you're done. And similarly, you can import the calendar component from Nivo um, and then give it all the necessary parameters to produce the calendar chart, like the one on the right. With that, we have completed the table. Um, the building blocks or level two to four are kind of at the sweet spot when you need more flexibility than the chart templates in level five, but still want to stand on the shoulder of the giants instead of starting from almost scratch, like level one. I feel in some example libraries so you can use as a re uh, as a reference, but I mean there are just example is not the complete universe, um, so um, some maybe not included here. Uh, from the leftmost column to the rightmost column, you can see the graphic libraries that I showed uh, some example of them earlier. Then the next column is the low level building blocks libraries. Then the grammar, we start to have more variety API design, then the high level building blocks, um, and lastly the chart templates, and there are like different API styles. The table can also be used as a scorecard to compare one or more libraries. One thing to clarify here is the level of abstraction is a continuous spectrum, not a discrete set of levels. 
Therefore, you may run into libraries that are somewhat borderline. Um, what's critical is not the semantic distinction between levels, but more about the developer's ability to understand the offer abstraction enough to select a library that is appropriate for their own use cases. So don't worry too much if you can decide if it's level three or four, you can place it in the middle. Uh, it is in fact also not uncommon for libraries to offer features from multiple levels of abstraction. DC.js has both chart templates and high level building blocks. G2 and G2 plot, which are from the same family of libraries, uh, is kind of uh, has this relationship of G2 plot being the chart templates on top of G2 grammar. React with has both high level building blocks, such as the XY plot and its some components, and chart templates, such as the sign key component, which you can use directly. Now let's come back to the big question, uh, which visualization library should I use? When picking libraries, um, the first thing I consider is that can they create what you need? For a basic thing like a bar chart, there are many choices. But if you are trying to create something nobody has ever seen before, then the choices may be more limited. Um, extra requirements such as drawing a scatter plot with millions of points is also not something every library can handle. After that first round, uh, if you're still in now with many choices, let's consider these other factors. How much time do you have? If the deadline is tomorrow, a high level libraries with low effort might be better. If you are expecting lots of customization, more flexibility, using the low uh, libraries might be more helpful. You may also consider the options that fit better with the target tech stack. Um, for example, if the target application is using Vue.js, then maybe you should find an option that works nicely with Vue. But that is only if it will be maintained in the long term. Uh, if it is a short project and nobody will look at the code again, then maybe that is not that important. Lastly, past experience or familiarity is also important because it can significantly reduce the amount of effort and learning curve. That's why many developers use D3 because they already know it very well. Um, sometimes it is faster to write more lines of code when you know what you're doing and learning a new libraries. So you have to adjust uh, the recommendation to the choice uh, that fits your own experience. To recap, the motivation of this talk came from trying to find a better way to answer the difficult question, which visualization library should I use? I explain how the libraries are organized by API design and level of abstraction into this design space, which we can use as a scorecard to help decide which one to use, combined with some guidelines. I hope you enjoyed the tool and learned a few things along the way. Um, perhaps the next time you come across a new package, you can analyze how it is different from or similar to the libraries that you already know. While there were many libraries were we'll mentioned, the list is by no means exhaustive. Again, um, I only focus on finding relevant examples and just limited to web-based libraries. I would be interested in seeing this expanded to other language and platform or include more examples libraries. This talk was adapted from the article with the same name that I wrote for 19K last year. I also include a link to it at the bottom if you are interested. Lastly, I would like to thank the people who helped make this talk possible. With that, I would like to end the talk here. Um, thank you very much.